Okay, hello everybody. I'm back here again, uh, possibly a couple of minutes too early. But uh, hello, Foster team. Hello, uh, and welcome, Roel. I did read your note just now, Roel. So uh, that's okay. If, if, even if you're a little bit late, that's okay. Uh, I understand that everybody is very busy, and you have your ministry as well. So um, good evening, Pastor team. Uh, good evening. Yes. Yeah. I pray that things are well with you and your congregations. By His grace, uh, Pastor Tim. Okay. Okay. Um, just before we get started on the, a quick Greek lesson, in the last session I was mentioning about the, the possibility, and there's always a possibility of, of war breaking out at some place in the world, that we see at this time in history that you know, there's these superpowers, there's a major shift actually, a geopolitical shift uh, between the, the states and uh, China and what's happening there, but, and now Russia as well. Uh, there's a lot of war going on, Ukraine and then Palestine as well, it's a big hot spot. There's flashpoints all the way through Africa. Um, the southern border of the United States, of course, big invasion there with the, you know, coming in from South America and then even to, into Europe. Uh, with the, you can call it quite, uh, I think, you know, we could, we have to call a spade a spade, and that means to say things for what they are. It's basically a Muslim invasion of Europe and England as well. Uh, it's becoming quite clear. Um, so it's just, you know, these things that are happening in history. And just to clarify what I'm saying, or to sort of confirm it, um, I, I get news feeds from what's called the Epic Times, E-P-O-C-H Times. It's not part of the mainstream news media. If you're getting your news from the CNN, uh, MNBC, I think it's called, and the, the other what they call mainstream news medias, um, you can't trust them. Because uh, a lot of these people, you know, their sponsors and their supporters and their shareholders are very liberal-leaning organizations. And they'll tell you what you want to hear. Uh, but I found that Epoch Times is more objective in their news, uh, more sort of central or more neutral. Uh, but just you know, from the first three headlines that I've seen, the first one says that Hamas and Fatah, that's the two main political groups in Palestine, they signed a, a declaration in Beijing on plans to form a joint government. So the Chinese government is supporting the Palestinian cause. Uh, and if you notice, you know, most Western nations, are, you know, they tend to be pro-Semitic and they're supporting Israel, maybe not 100%, but certainly not what China is doing. Yeah, and, and it's interesting, you have this whole block, BLOC, a whole group of people supporting Palestine. It's the communists, it's the Arabs, it's the Muslims um, and Russia, for example, as well. And yeah, so we see all these all these evil countries. You can say they're basically evil, um, and they're all supporting Palestine. They're all and oh, and the gay groups, the LGBT groups, they support Palestine. I don't know why. Yeah, you know, because the Palestine is very Muslim, and they certainly don't support LGBT. So it's interesting the way we see this. You know, the whole focus of, of people's support. And if they tend to be on the, you know, the leftist side, the liberals, uh, and that includes the communists, the Marxists, the Muslims, uh, they will support Palestine. And then on the other hand, you have like, you know, sort of your more, I say democratic, uh, your Western nations, the more Christian type nations, and they will be pro-Israel. Uh, so it's inter that's an interesting headline that, that Hamas and Fatah, the two main political groups in Palestine, they went to Beijing and China, and China was supporting their, uh, yeah, they're getting together. They're sponsoring them to, to be a, a more unified Palestine to fight against Israel. Um, another headline, the second headline that I had from the feed, Pentagon's new Arctic strategy aims to counter China-Russia partnership. So the Pentagon there, yeah, that's the American military, uh, they're working at how can we yeah, some, somehow disrupt this relationship now that's happening between China and Russia uh, and what's happening in the Arctic. And that's, you know, because that's a big, um, yeah, there, there's a big, um, a lot of oil reserves and stuff up in the Arctic as well. 
and Russia, that's they're very close to Alaska there, of course. Uh, and then the next headline was US, Canada intercept four Russian Chinese military aircraft. So the Russians have joined up with China and they're flying aircraft over Alaska, it says near Alaska's air defense zone. Um, so this is taking place in the last 24 hours. Uh, so we've seen these, these things take place in the world. Uh, I'm telling them, you these things not to be scared about them, but often you don't hear about it in the mainstream news, uh, whereas you know, I get my news from more independent sources, um, and I think it gives you a better idea of what's happening around the world. Uh, and it doesn't look good uh, for the unbelievers. For, for us believers, we, we're always copacetic, we're, uh, we're happy. We know that whatever happens in God's plan, we're going to be okay. Anyway, so that's just a little bit of catch up on the news. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I'll run you through our Greek lesson. Uh, sorry, some, uh, some verses in Matthew. Uh, just a review from last week, Matthew 1.1. 1, 1, we had the word here, Biblos, Genesios, Jesu, Christu, Wiu, David. I guess, yeah, because you got the alpha and the oops on, so Dawid, there's actually not a V sound there. Uh, we are, I'm just putting this down here. We are Abraham. Now, we are Dawid, we are Abraham. So, and literally, that means son. Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Uh, and in the Hebrew tense, the cultural sense, the son means the offspring. So, we're not talking about a literal son here, of course. Um, and remember also the interesting thing about this passage, well, they're, they're, it's all nouns. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You have eight words here and they're all nouns, which is um, it's a unique sentence. You're not going to see that in English for sure. Matthew 1, 2, we did this last week, so just quickly through it. Abraham, Egenesen, when we had the word to give birth to, Genao. Okay, that's the, the stem, the root verb, uh, but the form is going to change. If you see, here's, here's the, the root stem here, uh, gen, uh, so just these four letters, which match the four letters here, and then you have the prefix, and you have the suffix on the end. Uh, and then, remember, if you see the epsilon at the start of a verb, that's going to tell us that's the aorist tense. That's a good way to see. If you see a verb, if you can recognize that it's a verb in some form as an epsilon at the beginning, um, I think every time there might be exceptions, but I'm, I'm fairly sure that's the aorist. And that fits with us. V for verb, A for aorist, active, indicative. So Abraham is performing the action. What's he doing? He's giving, we say giving birth. He begat. They use the old English word begat, which means he fathered. He fathered Isaac. And here you have the word ton, that's the article. Okay, so the Isaac, Abraham fathered the Isaac. Uh, though we don't say the in this case, we see it's accusative. Okay, now the T here just means the article. A is accusative, singular, masculine, because we're talking about one person here, it's Isaac. And he is the object of the action. Abraham is the subject uh, is in the nominative case. Okay, uh, but we say that's the noun, but it's a, I, and I, I'm, I'm not sure why they have pry here. I think that means like a um, uh, like a pronoun, personal pronoun. Okay, I did try to check there, but it wasn't clear in the index. Uh, but you know, for other names, uh, they, they would call it, it's definitely a noun. Okay, but he's in the nominative case. And Isaac, because he's the object of the of the what's happening, okay, Abraham gave birth to Isaac. We see this is in the accusative case. In English, we'd say that's the object. Abraham gave birth to the Isaac, and this again a noun, and they're saying this is a pro um, like a, a pronoun, but he's in the accusative case as well. And then Isaac now. He's going to be in the, no uh, the noun case again, but this would be nominative. It's not changing here, so possibly because it's a Hebraism, it's a Hebrew name, and the writers didn't know how to bring that over to the Greek and the, the Greek forms. Uh, so it's possibly they did that just for these names. Though, though many of the Hebrew names, they do change. Okay, but in this case, the uh, the writers written the uh, the 
accusative case and the nominative case for Isaac is the same. Okay, and then you have the word and, de. Uh, de can also mean but, it's like a soft but uh, in the Greek, but usually we just translate and. And in this case, the context tells us it must be and or and then. Uh, de can also mean also or to, like yeah, he did this to, something like that. Uh, and then, and then we have the same pattern, remember? De egenesen ton Jacob. So Isaac gave birth to Jacob. Jacob. Okay, Jacob de egenesen ton Judan. And Judan, that's Judah, of course. So Jacob gives birth to Judah. Kai. Now we have the word Kai, which is the same as de. Uh, but here they're, they're joining. So we're not going to have the verb in here again. So he's giving birth to Judah and his uh, brothers, Adelphus. Okay, now that they, I guess he could have used dare, but dare is more emphasized and then, whereas Judah and, we're talking about, you know, this person and his brothers. Uh, so, Judan, Kai, Trus, Adelphus, our two. And we've had this in our Greek. Um, in our Greek writings, you're familiar, you should be familiar now with the, uh, this is the accusative, okay, the Adelphus, he's given birth to the brothers and his, and that's the genitive, his brother. So if you see the word al tu, al tu means him. Uh, al tos, you have the, the different forms, al tos is the nominative, and then al tu is the genitive. Okay, so in this case, you have his brothers. Okay, we'll see that later once we get to use of the more use of the pronouns. Uh, for now, we're just sort of getting through, just so you can read, read through the Greek and you can see some of the concepts. It continues again. Judas, so that's Judah. So yeah, now in this case, now they're telling us in the software here, this is the, the nominative singular masculine. If you use the software from the Bible Hub website, it, it, it gives you a clearer idea of these. In the eSword, it's not so consistent for some reason. Okay, but so Judah, uh, he was, the, I think, the third son of Jacob. Uh, and he, now usually we see the rights of the line going down to the first person. But remember there was, um, it was Simeon and... Uh, somebody and, and Levi is number two, but uh, Simeon is the older son. He um, he committed crimes. I guess committed sin against his father and slept with his father's uh, housemate. I think it was that cut him out of the line. And then Levi took on the priesthood, uh, and Judas, you know, he was next in the line for the blessings, and he becomes in the line of Jesus Christ. So uh, Judah or Jude. <coughs> Uh, de Egenesen. So he gives birth to Faris. Uh, that's Peres. In, in, uh, in English, sometimes they say Peres. <coughs> Let me just turn off the. This um, when you read in the book of Ruth, as we're doing our studies in the book of Ruth, we're going to see in the last chapter of Ruth where the people are saying, you know, blessed be Boaz and Ruth, as was uh, Tamar and and um, and Peres. And it's an interesting statement to make. If you remember that Tamar, this is going back to Genesis chapter 38, Tamar ended up sleeping with Judah. And Tamar was the daughter-in-law who had the two sons of Judah. Uh, how does that work? Uh, hang on, let me think about this. That's right, that the first two sons of Judah, um, oh, I can't remember their names, okay, uh, but they, they were under divine discipline. She got married to the first son, and then he died, the son unto death. And then she got married to the second son as according to the custom of the time, and you know, Judah had agreed with that, that Tamar can marry the second son. Uh, and then he died shortly after as well, and because he didn't want his uh, Tamar to be the child of his, uh, the, be the mother of his children. 
and the, you know, the Bible says he spilled his seed. So that means that he didn't impregnate Tamar. And because of, you know, the, in the eyes of the Lord, this was evil. The second son died, and then Judah kept the third son back and had no intention of allowing Tamar to marry the third son. And so Tamar dressed herself up as a prostitute, and, and Judah, in his hypocrisy, um, you know, he, he likes to think he's this very noble person, but Judah ends up having sex with Tamar, thinking she's a prostitute, and there's that whole story goes on. Uh, and then we see that Pharaoh's is going to be the offspring of that in the line. And then it's mentioned in the book of Ruth because it's a similar uh, scenario where if you remember that you have the kinsman redeemer or Boaz, uh, you know, Ruth is to carry on the, the, the line. Uh, she's, uh, Boaz allows himself to get married to her and that continues on uh, the inheritance which would have been given to, uh, to how does that work, um, to Ruth's family uh, from her husband. Okay, but you can read about that. That comes in later on. But just to mention there's that connection <coughs> uh, between in the book of Ruth uh, and Ruth getting married to Boaz and then what's happening here and with, um, uh, with Tamar and having Pharaoh's or Pharaoh's, as it says here, as the offspring. Okay, and if you don't understand that background, so it's, you, you wonder why they're praising Tama and, and Pharaoh's because it seems like a, a weird relationship and the way that Pharaoh's came about. Uh, okay, so, but Tama actually had two sons, so Pharaoh's and Zara, they were born as twins. Now we have the word ek, means out from, out from Tama. So that's an interesting expression, but it literally means born from Tama. And then Pharaoh, he gets the, the rights as the, the firstborn child. Uh, though they had an interesting situation in their birth. You can read about that in Genesis 38 as well. But Pharaoh is designated as the, the first child, even though they were twins. De uh, Eganesson, so Pharaoh is now, he's giving birth to who? To Ehezron. Uh, you can't see it here, but in the English it comes out, we have the H. Oh, there, there should be the, the rough breather there. So we, we, yeah, in English, we write it as H-E-Z-R-O-N. The software is not showing this, but this is Hezron. Uh, and then Hezron de Eganesen ton Aram. Okay, and then we get into the, uh, in the time of when the Jews went down to Egypt. So the next generations, all the way down to uh, Salmon, are going to be born in the... Uh, they're going to be born during their time in Egypt. Okay, you see the names there. So you can have a look at the software this yourself. Uh, we're just doing the, the names to help with your reading. We'll get down to verse 7 because there's an interesting concept there. Uh, so, Aram, De, Egenesin, and all these, the, the word for giving birth to, Erist, active, indicative, third person, singular. So he gives birth, Ton, Aminadab. Aminadab de Egenesen ton naason. We say naason in the English. Okay, but the, you know, from the Greek, they're trying to make the best transliteration from the Hebrew that they can. Naason de Egenesen ton Salmon. Okay, and it's going to be Salmon. He's the one that's going to marry Rahab. Uh, okay, so we have those names there. Just a couple more verses. So, it's fair, this is very simple Greek, and it's all just the same pattern. Salmon de Egenesen ton Boaz. And this is the Boaz that's, that's marrying Ruth, of course. Uh, out. Oh, so I've lost the connection. Uh, Boaz ek teis Rahab. And so Boaz was born out from Rahab. So the person that Ruth's marrying is actually the son of Rahab. And so we see this, this great line of woman through there. Rahab, she's, she's not a Jewish woman either. And then Ruth, is, she's a Moabitess. So you have these two great women in the line of Jesus Christ. And they're, they're not Jewish, of course. Um, and you know, one of them was an a ex-prostitute, that's Rahab. 
and then we have Ruth, who was some woman who married, uh, you know, she was a Moabitess, uh, and then she just happened to follow her mother-in-law back to Israel. Uh, I say happened to, but you know, she was she was a believer, and that's why she wanted to come back uh, to Israel to to be with the Lord's people. Uh, so Boaz was born. We say ek taste, but uh, born out from. Let's see how they do it in English. And Boaz fathered Obed of. See, they say of Ruth, but really, um, ek taste Ruth. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, um, oh, and I guess in this case, you don't see many women mentioned in the, in the genealogy. But if a woman is mentioned, it means that the Lord wants to honor her. And in this case, he's honored Rahab up here, okay, by making specific mention because you know, Rahab is the great woman here. So from uh, Boaz came from Rahab, and Boaz gave birth to uh, Yabed, Yobed, that's Obed, from Ruth. See, God is making specific mention of Ruth in here. He doesn't have to, of course, because he's just mentioning the man. But in this case, in the same verse here, we see he makes mention of Rahab and he makes mention of Ruth, two great women of the Bible. And they're going to give birth to the, this will be the grandfather of David. So that's a great honor for them. So uh, Yobed, that's Obed, there, and then Yobed gives birth to Yesai, yes, uh, Yesai, I guess that's Jesse, that's the father of David. So you see that here, Salmon fathered Boaz of Rahab, that's the name mentioned there, and Boaz fathered Obed of Ruth, and Obed fathered Jesse. Uh, now we're going to see in total there's going to be four women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Um, of course, there's, we see that Rahab, Ruth, <coughs> and then we're going to see another woman mentioned, and then of course you get down to Mary. Uh, so I'll just give you one more, I think oh, two more verses, oh, just this one verse here. So Matthew 1, 6, this is our last verse for today. Uh, yes, I, so they say that's you know, Jesse. De Egenesen ton David ton Basilia. Uh, now here we have a construction here. Notice you got the article before David, ton David. So that's, you know, we, in English it looks like the David, but we don't say the article, we say David. But if you see an article here, now the article is in the accusative singular masculine because David is the object of the, of the sentence. And then we have the same form again. You have ton again, accusative singular masculine, as this is here. And you have the word basilia, which means king. But this is going to be a basilius. That's the nominative form here. We have the name Basil. If you ever meet anybody by the name of Basil, uh, this, his parents, have, if they know the meaning, it's because they named him because they want him to be a king, possibly. Uh, but the meaning is just the king. Uh, but here again, the, the ending changes a little bit because we're in the accusative, not the nominative. Okay, but the word is king, the king. So the David, the king. Now look at the form here. And you, you need to remember, this is a very important aspect of Greek, if you're going to describe somebody, you can use an adjective, but in this case what they do is they put the, the form. So here's David the king. And this is how they, they would express somebody. I think it's called a predicate nominative in the English. Um, you say, um, you know, Fetty the teacher, for example. Um, or you could say, I have a cat screaming out here at the moment, Willow the cat. And so you'd have the name, and then you have the cat, um, and it would just be Ton, like my cat's name is Willow, and then Ton, um, I think something like Felis or something is the word for cat, for Felos, so, uh, and the um, accuser might, might be f uh, Felia, possibly, following the ending here. But you, you see the form there, so you have um, the two, oh, here she is, here. here is my cat, this is Willow, by the way. Just to say hello and goodbye. Okay, so um, so the David, the king, make sure you remember this form because it helps. Sometimes they will put the, the name David. You might have something else put in the middle and then you have the, uh, and then you have the predicate nominative, which uh, predicate be accusative.
describing the noun, but the the articles will match, and the uh, and the form of the noun will also match. If it doesn't match, then it's not related. If it does match, that's telling you these two things fit together. Okay, so here we have Jesse gives birth to David, or gave birth to David the king, and then and it just goes straight on saying David, or and David gives birth to. Now he's giving birth here to King Solomon. You can see the word there, Solomona. Okay, that's Solomon in the accusative singular masculine. And here it's interesting. Um, out from, now he doesn't mention the name of Bathsheba, okay, but he's saying out from the one of Bathsheba, which is Uriah, 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 uh, sorry, out from the one of Uriah. And we don't see the name mentioned. I just wait for the internet. The internet's gone off. Okay, I just pause there. I see my internet connection is not so stable, okay? Uh, but it says in this case here, the one of Uriah. And here we, we see the King James translate this. I don't know how they do it in other Bible. I should check. But the king fathered Solomon of, and here we have ellipsis. This goes all the way back to one of our first lessons where I mentioned ellipsis. They will have something in the italics. It's not in the Bible. Even, actually, even the word wife is not there. But because you have the word two, and two is genitive. Remember, genitive expresses uh, possession. So we'd say the one of. In this case, it's like a, it's a relative. Okay, but it's like an article, but it, it functions as a relative. Uh, so if you said, um, actually we couldn't do it in English, I think, but if you said, um, here is the book, and I want the, but the, the, the article often in Greek, it acts as a relative, so uh, that, that, I would say that, I want that. But in English, uh, in the Greek, it can be expressed with the article. Okay, so in this case, here is the article for Uriah, Oh, sorry, the article here is the feminine, so this is the um, the one of, and then from, or which was, it's like, I'm not explaining this very well, but um, so out from, and see, this is the, the feminine article here, that which was, we say that, the one, who was of, this is two of, the, and the of the, Uriah. And that's the husband, the, the first husband of Bathsheba. Now, it's interesting that in this case, um, and you have to go back to when you look about David, the relationship between David and Bathsheba, David loved Bathsheba, but Bathsheba never loved David. Just waiting for my cat to get settled. Go on. Okay, so, um, yeah, David... Again, he loved Bathsheba, but she couldn't love him. She was very bitter, possibly towards the end of, you know, throughout her whole life, because, you know, David had basically killed her husband. Uh, and, and, well, first he raped her and got her pregnant uh, and then killed her husband. And we don't know whether she actually knew that, I think, but it's possibly it came out at some point, or maybe she even um, uh, at least understood in some way David had some part in that. Uh, Okay, excuse me. Okay, so um, it's just an interesting passage here where we see that God is recognizing that Uriah was really the true husband of Bathsheba, not, not David. Uh, so, yeah, you can have a think about that yourself. Let me just get rid of this cat, excuse me. Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so anyway, that brings us up to our, the end of our Greek lesson today. Um, any questions about that? There is a pastor team. I, I just noticed that uh, the liter, the first liter, sing Yuta. As well as Judah, Jesse, Jacob, 
to uh, is this uh, converted to liturgy? Uh, so, sorry, which verse are you talking about here, sir? Oh, sorry, the, the internet cut out. Can, can you try again? <laughs> so I, I, I didn't catch that. Uh, in Matthew 1, 2 and 3, the first letter in the name of Jesus, we are using uh, Iota instead of uh, Jesus, uh, the name of Jesus, the name of Judas, the name oh. of Jacob. Okay. The name of Judas, we are just using Iota. That's right. Why well, there is no liturgy in Greek? Um, well, no, there's, there's no letter J, um, and even in the in the Hebrew, that would be the Yod it comes out of the Yod, which is like like a Y sound. There's there's no J sound in the Hebrew either. Uh, so Yitzhak, this would be in, in the Hebrew that they're, they're transliterating from Yitzhak. Uh, Jesus is transliterated like from Yeshua, for example. Uh, Jacob would be Yahob, ya, I think it's Yahob. Uh, so you're having this this Y sound, um, but they don't have the Y in the Greek either. So there's no J and there's no Y. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. So the best they can do is get the I, and that's like the E. So you're, you're like uh, Yahob, and within the I sound, when you sound it out, you sort of get the the Y aspect come out in that. But that's the best they can do when they transliterate. So uh, uh, the Y is just uh, what you call that uh, converted to I because and of the sound. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And again, so that's okay. okay, that's okay. Yeah. So you just have to keep that in mind. That there's no um, in the Hebrew. There's no J sound, uh, but they have the Y sound. And then in the Greek, there's no Y and there's no J sound. Uh, Greek only has 24 letters altogether, and in the Hebrew they only have 22 actually, uh, so they're limited uh, in, in the sounds. But that's again, that's the best they can do. But, uh, but Pastor Tim, uh, Isaac is now using I, so this is correct. Well, this one here, you have Isaac here, so uh, we do not need to pronounce. G Saak. Oh, I see what you mean, right? Um, yeah, but if we were pronouncing it like in, in the proper Hebrew, that would be Yit, they, they would say Yitzhak as the name uh -huh. Isaac. Uh, yeah, but in English, yeah, we just uh, we don't go back. We should probably be going back to the Y of the Hebrew, but we've taken the name Isaac in English from from the Greek, obviously, not the Hebrew. Okay, thank you, Pastor Tim. Okay. Any other questions? Thirteen. How how about the uh, David in Matthew one? Why is it using a uh, letter uh, uh, epsilon instead of instead of use, using beta? Instead of using what? Sorry. Instead of using let, letter beta beta. Oh, but that would be David. David. Oh, I see what you mean, right. Um, yeah. David. David, David, David. I'd have to check on the Hebrew how the name is uh, spelt. But I think in the Hebrew is... Oh, here they've got David here. Yeah, that's interesting. Uh, when they transliterate it down the bottom in the dictionary, they have David. David from the Hebrew origin. Let's just see if this can come up in my Hebrew dictionary here. Uh, David, King David. Okay, yeah. So it's interesting. Yeah, they, they could have put the the beta in, uh, but again, that they chose to use David. They they cut out the B sound for some reason. Uh, I'm not sure why they did that. But then in English, you see, we bring it into the V. as David. Very hard V. Uh, that's an interesting question, but because it, even in the dictionary they have it here, as you can see, David. 
Okay, but uh, yeah, that's how you know names do change, and even like uh, you know simple names, you see different formations of them all around the world, and it just it depends how well their phonetic system accommodates the name, and then it has to be changed, obviously. Okay, you know, so I think that's enough you know, for you to work through. Um, I I haven't set you your Greek homework properly yet for the next assignment. I'm waiting for you to come back with your other assignments, for, especially from exercise 45, which we had from the New Testament Greek for beginners. Uh, but over the next week or so, I'll set you some more Greek assignments. Uh, and you know, it'll be basically just translating stuff and doing pronunciation. Um, you, you're doing pretty well. I know it's very difficult. Um, but it just it will keep with that and we'll just slowly move forward in the Greek. Okay, anyway, so that brings us up to, that's enough for today. Let's just finish off with the closing prayer then. Okay. Uh, Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for the opportunity that we had today uh, to study uh, from the lessons that we're learning as part of our courses at the moment and even from the Greek, from, from your word, uh, that our understanding of the Greek language will uh, grow greater and therefore our understanding of your word. So we give thanks for these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, have a good week, everybody. And, Thank you, Mr. Uh, Tim. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Tim.